right. Well, thank you, Rochelle. Does that mean that we are now doing the intro in front of a bunch of people? Is that what's happening? Do it. Okay, amazing. I can't mess it up, right? Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Karen. <laughs> Welcome to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast for fans who aren't ready to let go and newcomers to the series who are ready to jump in. I'm Marie Vigourou. And I'm Drew Solman. In this episode, we're doing a recap of Supernatural Season 1 through the theme of family. And as we always say, let's get this show on the road. Now, of course, we don't there have... Would normally... <laughs> we no, don't have our music here, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. We don't have our music today, but... Uh, once we actually put it together, we'll be able to add the music. So it'll be like magic of editing, right? You get okay, some behind so, the scenes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So can, Drew, can you start by giving a little bit of just context for people who will be listening to this as a recording and to explain maybe why we sound so giddy and excited? Well, I mean, this is our first live show. This is the first time we are uh, presenting with our listeners in front of us one they can see us not just hear us so on top of it being our first live it's our first video or recorded so there's a lot of excitement there it's a lot to take in but i'm i'm just beyond excited and ready to get going <laughs> oh my goodness me too well let's actually oh okay so as is tradition the timer is not ready <laughs> of course no Again, some of the behind the scenes magic, we never have the timer ready. Nope, never, never. But, but while Mary gets the timer ready, I will explain for those who don't know yet, just some of the newcomers who are coming just to support us for the first time live. Uh, we start most episodes or all episodes with me doing a recap of the episode in one or two minutes. I think we agreed on three minutes this time because I'm going to try to recap the entire first season as concisely as I can. <laughs> yeah. So Drew, I am giving you three minutes um, to recap all of season one. Three, two, I'm going very one. general here, but yes. Go. We start with the family in their lovely little home. Uh, two young boys, a mom and dad, very classic. Uh, but suddenly something terrible happens. Mom is up in a burst of flames. The boys all three escape and thus begins a life of hunting for demons to find the thing that took their mother from them. Uh, in short, brothers hunt things. We learn that Sam doesn't want to keep hunting things. He goes back to school, finds a life for himself. Eventually, Dean shows up and goes, we have to go back to hunting because dad's missing. And Sam's all like, okay, I'll help you this one time before the same demon that took their mother takes his girlfriend, Jess. And then the boys begin a road trip of fighting monsters, such as spirits in the woods, ghost children, demon on a plane, ghost in a mirror, shapeshifter, religious hook ghost, bee. A poltergeist, mad science ghost, a scarecrow, literally death itself, racist the truck, a psychic teenager, murder hillbillies, demon shadows, a haunted house powered by the internet and stupidity, creepy old witch, a haunted painting, vampires, and of course, demons. Through all, all this, our major key points are we learn that Sam's a little more special than we thought. Despite having a hero complex, he also seems to have psychic visions and powers. We then learn he's not alone in this when he meets another someone with powers whose mother was also mysteriously killed by a fire demon. Ooh, could there be a connection? Uh, we eventually reunite with dad, but then dad leaves, but then dad comes back. We find a magical gun that can kill demons. And that brings us to the end of the series when we finally have a confrontation with that demon, but things don't go so well. Mm. Time. <laughs> Okay, so you actually did amazing because you still have a full minute and 26 seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll be very honest. I was kind of nervous coming into this large of a recap. So I took some very quick notes that I think became way too good. Yes, I feel like <laughs> you came a little resist. too prepared to this one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, it's a special fine. episode, okay? <laughs> it is. It's a really special episode. I totally agree with that. It's fine. I just... I really liked when you started naming all of the episodes slowly but surely. <laughs> I thought it'd be a really fun little thing to do. Give a recap of all the things we faced, including bees. Bees? I know that was very. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, Mel, bees. Very... <laughs> bees? Michael? Yes, that was funny. <laughs> so normally here we go into a long game, which was kind of our way of what may have what may have been missed in the long game that would be relevant to today's conversation 
but I think we're going to do a lot of that in today's conversation going over the whole season that is hard to nitpick. So we wanted to use this time instead to kind of go over the long game of this podcast. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm being not too forward. No, that's absolutely fine. So like, what about you, Drew? Like if you look back on this first leg of our journey together, um, what stands out to you? I really think the biggest takeaway is just how much this has grown. Like, yeah. so for transparency's sake, I have had several smaller podcasts prior to this, none that ever took off anywhere near this. And again, I think Rochelle is a huge reason to thank for that, along with you, Mary. But I was used to very small audiences, mostly friends and family listening. If anything, just a few you know, uh, niche people who were a fan of whatever the medium was we were doing. It was, you know, I figured we'll go as far as we can until either things peter out or we decide to take a longer than expected break. Like, no, I'm not going to hold it against. It's Mary's first time doing a podcast, too. But I knew we would, like, push as far as we could, and clearly we both want this to happen. And then, I mean, if it isn't obvious by the number of people here watching us do this live right now, people seem to like what we do. And I'm not surprised by that, but it's just, I don't want to be overwhelming. Overwhelming is not the right word. It is just a lot, and I love it. Yeah, it's definitely touching. I totally get that. I mean... If, if I, if I can go ahead, I mean, on my end, it's please, basically please, please, the please, same please. thing, right? It's, <laughs> I figured, you know, let's do a couple episodes and see where it takes us and look at us <laughs> today. <laughs> so, yeah. And I really do think, like you mentioned that like the decision to bring Rochelle on like what a week before we launched was really our absolute best decision. So like big giant air high five to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, because like, I know that she's not in front of the mic often, but she works on every single episode and she makes some really tough decisions about what to keep on the podcast and what to leave out. And I mean, just to give you guys an idea, we usually hand her like anywhere between an hour and a half, like an hour to an hour and a half of content. And she has to bring it down to like 40 to 50 minutes. So, wow. Um, Basically, this podcast just would not be the same without her. So thank you. And um, yeah, like you said, the buy-in, like, I can't believe it. You know, neither, when we started, neither of us was really active in fandom circles. Like, we just sort of showed up and we got adopted into the Supernatural family. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Drew, for being my, my partner in crime every week. Because honestly, like, <laughs> it would not be the same without you. <laughs> I could not do any of this with you. Like you made the joke of like your notes for this episode are so good that I can do it without you. And it's like, no, cause I wouldn't have that energy, that heart and that knowledge that you bring. Oh, thank you. Well, now that we're done throwing flowers at each other, <laughs> are we ready to move into story time? Yes, let's. All right, so, perfect. You got to start us off? Yeah, for sure. So as we've announced, uh, we'll be looking at the season as a whole, really through the theme of family, um, more specifically how the meaning of family for Sam and Dean evolved through the season. So if we can maybe start with Sam, um, Drew, do you, do you want to start with, with Sam or do you want me to get started? No, I could, I could start a little bit. I feel like Sam very much is the typical American dream family at the beginning at least mm -hmm. he is living with a woman who he seems to see a future with well as much as you could until what happens uh he's the classic go to school graduate get a job get married like you could picture episode one Sam a few years down the line with the very classic house on a perfect little street with the white picket mm -hmm. fence and the three perfectly like children he was very the family is the family you you are with and even though there was clearly a disconnect from his father and brother due to the upbringing they encountered it, he always sort of seemed to have that very classic family vibe to him at the beginning at least yeah at the very least like that's what he's aspiring to right like that's what he wants mm -hmm. that's what that's the ideal, the fantasy. And as we know, as adults and as watcher of the show, the fantasy doesn't 
always come true. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. Yes. No one's fantasy come true in this show, I've learned. Unfortunately, no. Um, <laughs> but moving on. <laughs> moving on. Um, so for me, it's interesting because at the beginning of the season, I find that we really see Sam dealing with the absence, particularly of his blood family, right? He's missing his dad, his brother, like he's only surrounded with friends and people that he's chosen to be in his life. Uh, you know, he relies on, on those people, this chosen or this found family, and particularly Jess. Um, yeah. And we know that he was going to propose to her. So he wanted to marry her. He wanted to like officialize the fact that he thought of her as family. And I think that that's really important. When we talk about Jess, we have to realize that to Sam, she was family. Um, of course, as we know, Sam then has to deal with the sudden and traumatic loss of Jess, uh, much like John yeah. had to deal with the sudden and traumatic loss of Mary. And then as the season goes on, we kind of see that Sam is realizing that blood family can also be found family. And this, mm -hmm. this really brings me back to a conversation that we had in one of our episodes earlier in the season about my sister and I, about how we see each other both as blood family and found family. Because like, yes, we are sisters by blood, but we make the conscious effort and the conscious decision to be close to one another. Like we don't just take it for granted. And I really think that Sam now also sees Dean as both of these things, blood and found family or chosen family. And also like, I don't know what you think, but I really saw that shift in Sam and Scarecrow when he abandons the search for John to go and save Dean. Like to me, that was really like, Okay, Sam has chosen his family, and his family is Dean. Yes, because in Scarecrow, at that point, we are still at a crossroads moment where we haven't fully seen Sam change his thoughts on family and his goals. As we learn later, his goals become much more revenge on this demon, less of the get back to a normal life that he kind of starts with. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a shift there. This is a moment where he's realizing that the hunt for this demon, this revenge plot, this just find dad and everything goes back to normal that they've had up to this point doesn't matter as much if he can't be with his brother, the only family he really has anymore that he's chosen to keep with him. Yeah. Now, obviously, as you know, I also like to I like to ask you questions and I like to have you live react to things. And most of what we had planned today, we knew like we have shared notes. So there's no real blindsiding here, except now because mm -hmm. I have two things that I would like you to live react to. So Go ahead. do you, <laughs> thank you. Do you remember in that first episode where Sam and Jess are talking and then uh, Sam asks Jess like, oh, what would I do without you? Do you remember what Jess replies? I don't recall what she replies. She replies, crash and burn. Oh, poor choice of words. Do you oh, so poor obviously choice of we words. know what happens at the end of that first episode about the burning? Mm -hmm. But what happens at the end of the season? Oh. If that is intentional, these writers, once again, damn. And if it's not intentional, still very impressive. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. I am. <laughs> we, we don't have time for me to like sit back and recover from that, but like, wow. Yeah. So just to kind of show, like, this is, this is what you can expect for the next, um, like, 15 seasons, 14 at this point, so be ready. <laughs> now, the uh, I always is, say I'm prepared for heartbreak and pain, but I never am apparently. I mean, this show will break your heart in so many ways, like in so many, so many ways. But let's move on to the <laughs> second thing that I'd like you to live react to. So, Oh yeah, there's two remember, of them there. Do you remember the date of Mary's death? No, I do not. It is. I'm still like a bad student. I'm doing my homework. 
<laughs> no, 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 not at all. Don't worry. So th this is very niche. Like I'm not, these are specific okay. lines, very specific things. Okay. So it's six months after Sam's birth, which happens to be November 2nd, uh, 1983. Do you remember the date of Jess's death? Oh God, is it the same date? It's November 2nd, 2005. This demon just like, come on. Yeah. So there you go. That's for Sam and family. So if, uh, if you guys wonder why um, Sam has an interesting relationship to family on top of everything else, well, there you go. I think that we always have to remember that to him, Jess is family and that she's no longer there. He has lost like someone that can basically never be replaced for him in so many ways so. yeah and i mean if we can i know we're going to do a little more of a summary too when we get to dean but if we can take away from sam's uh, mm -hmm. development at least i think it's important to show that i think the two biggest points that both were brought up by you is that found family and blood family are equal mm -hmm. and can be the same thing yeah. you know it's one thing to say that dean and him are brothers but the way they care for each other and help each other and are there for each other and support each other, it really shows that they go above and beyond just being blood brothers. They are truly found family. They are proper family. I fully agree. And I find it sad, actually, that this stays very much in the subtext in season one. I wish that it had been maybe stated a bit more explicitly or a bit more textually so that yeah, anyway, I have I have points about that later, as you know. So <laughs> let's let's move on to Dean for now. What does family mean to Dean? And obviously, because of all of the analysis that we've done in the past few months, uh, I'd really like us to keep in mind that Dean is a queer character here. So do you want to start us off with Dean? Yeah, I mean, I think when we think of queer characters, we think of queer storylines. Very often a major point when it comes to their families, it's often that almost a cliche you would see in TV is the family discards you because they don't agree with you so you find your own family but here we have Dean struggling with this inner turmoil while also finding family within his own family mm -hmm. uh, we see the way it affects his relationship with John his father but also how he's able to keep this strong relationship with Sam but then we've also got the side of Dean where we see the way he almost avoids making connections in a familial sense yeah. Because he understands the pain it brings people when he has to suddenly disappear or, you know, we, we look at like Cassie and just it doesn't work between them because she thinks he's lying and he can't tell her even when he tells her the truth, it doesn't work. Again, you can go back and listen to that, uh, that episode, but I mean, what it really comes down to is just that he pushes people away because he doesn't want to let them get to know the real him. And it's hard for him to find people who truly accept him. In this case, I'm saying it in the terms of a demon hunter, but I think it goes a layer deeper to his bisexuality. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like something that you just said right now made me realize that, because we've talked about this quite a bit, especially lately, about how Dean has like immense emotional reserves, um, but he also has very little emotional maturity. And so that creates this weird space for him where he wants to give so much, but it's difficult for him to kind of like focus in some ways. And I'm like, yeah, this is just a thought that came right now. So I don't know how well fleshed out it is, but it's just like what you said, what it's bringing out of me at the moment. And if the MO of the show is just one of us says a thing and sends it on a spiral. So yeah, I'm glad we got a live one at least. We're not allowed to spiral today, so unfortunately. Little spiral. Just little, Tiny little spiral. spiral. It, it, yeah, exactly. And uh, like, but before yeah. I give up the floor, but before I give up the floor on Dean, I was also going to say is just that we also see how well he responds to figures in his life that he considers to be closer. Uh, the two examples I noted were both Missouri and Bobby. They play a somewhat parental guiding role uh, clearly, while he was growing up, they were around enough that he saw them as respected adults who respected him equally. And you can see that level of comfort he has with them, where 
when Missouri kind of gives him the like classic mom lines of like, oh, you should be cleaning up or doing something. It doesn't seem out of place. It doesn't seem hurt by it. He seems like to be brought back to a place of childhood where he's like, oh yeah, like people can care for me and can treat me like a human. Mm -hmm. I I think it just shows that even though Dean has these people in his life that he might not immediately consider family, he Mm -hmm. treats them as such. And when they, when they do it to him, it just gives him this moment of like comfort. Oh, Dean, Dean. Dean. (laughs) Would you like to continue on our Dean topics? Of course, of course. Yeah, I mean, like, in the same vein, what you're saying is that at at the beginning of the season, like, what's being established is that family, and again, particularly blood family, is everything to him. Like, it's the only thing that truly matters. Um, the only thing that matters, again, is like Sam and John. And he sees John as someone to be obeyed, someone to go to when he has doubts, Um and, and we see that in the way that he prayed to him at home, the way that he replies, yes, sir, after he's given an order. And more importantly and heartbreakingly, to me anyway, we see it when he replies, if that's what it takes, when Sam asks him if he's okay with John bossing them around in dead man's blood. And I think the reason, I know, I know, Drew. And I think that to me, that really shows that Dean has basically been putting himself, his true personality, or, or at least like aspects of it. Um, and I think obviously his, his sexual identity behind anything and everything that John wanted, because he felt like John's love for him was conditional on him putting John first. So like parentification much, you know, deep queer coding much, like we're, we're seeing that very much at this moment. And Luckily, though, we see an evolution in Dean as well, like through the season. Uh, We see him start to realize that John is not this like all knowing person. And we see a hint. Yeah. And we see a hint that Dean doesn't want to keep the current dynamic at any cost. Right. He starts talking back a little bit more. And this shows like some sort of desire to break from the mold and even like, dare I say, to like come out of that closet that he's stuck himself into and interestingly that shift became super visible to me in dead man's blood which is also an episode that deals so much with queerness and i just like yeah yeah no seeing dean's growth over the season like i feel like though we talked about sam's it feels very simple it's it, it, seems like a very simple narrative but Dean feels so layered that there's just a there's just like this really complex layer to not just being able to admit when he needs family like or admit that family is what keeps him going like we have that made or break moment in the finale where he says that you're all I have you're what I need to keep moving forward you're the reason I do this and it really is like when we talk about I believe we have a moment also in the finale when uh, John is talking about what he wants for the boys and he wants Sam to go back to school and go back to the normal life. And then we have Dean who he doesn't know what he wants, but he knows he wants Dean to have family and be happy and not have to be hunting demons. Mm -hmm. And that's that's when Dean realizes it's really just family. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, Dean and Sam. Those poor boys. I know. Those poor boys. I know. Are we, I'm just looking at the time here. Are we ready to move on to critical time a little bit? I was then saying the same thing. I think we're good too. Yes. Okay, perfect. Do you want, uh, do you, how do we go about it? Do you want to start? I I feel like I wanted to let you start critical time. I feel like your first point is very salient. I want to get through it properly. Okay. So in critical time, um, I actually, so little disclaimer, I actually went through most of our podcast episodes to kind of like hear back what we were saying, <laughs> because it's just interesting to see the progression, right? Like, I mean, we're very much right now at the very end of season one, and it was really interesting to kind of go back. And so looking back at the season of Supernatural as a whole, I'm surprised to have seen so many episodes that only focused on the brothers. 
Uh, and we talked about that in Salvation a little bit, about how there's just a handful of episodes in the season that have an A and B storyline. And if yeah. we... Yeah. And if we like bring it back to the context of time, of course, I think that this was really new at the time. Like so many shows on the WB, because remember it was the WB, not the CW at that time. And other networks at the time focused on like ensemble casts with a heavy emphasis on romance that this show decided to really go against that grain and focus just on the two brothers. Now, as we've discussed earlier, I think that this, this was somewhat of a miscalculation, in my opinion, because romance can become family. You know, if mm-hmm. we're looking at Mar- <clears throat> sorry, Mary and John, they're not blood family, but they're, they're family because they married each other. And same thing for Sam and Jess, like they're not related to one another, but yet they are, they, at least Sam considers her family enough to want to marry her and start a family with her. Um, and so this idea blossoming here that like the show's not about romance, it's about family, as if the two could not be linked, is eventually going to become like a powerful argument of some parts of the fandom and also the general audience against queer themes and found family. And like, obviously there was no way that people could have known that at the time. So it's, but it's just an observation that is weighing pretty heavily on me at this moment because of so many things. So I don't know. I don't know what you think about it, Drew, because you you haven't seen the whole thing, but yeah. No, and I feel like that's always that weird angle of knowing there's more out there. And yes, I've heard things here and there. I have been spoiled in little ways. I know some basic plot points, but that like underlying context is really what I'm not seeing until I get to those episodes mm-hmm. like if you would ask me to discuss the family themes of what I remember from the first few seasons I watched before doing the show zero mm-hmm. so it really still leaves a lot to be surprised but from what we got in the first season I can kind of see where it's going and I'll be curious to follow that thread as we go further mm-hmm. because yeah you're right I feel like at the time a lesser show would have just written in a third character who was one of their you know a female character that wasn't particularly dating either one so there could always be the audience reaction like oh which one will she end up with and would have ruined her as a character and just gotten between the brothers in some way and ruined their story but i feel like a really good show could have written in a romantic partner as well and made them part of the family and not made it a big deal and use it like you said just to sort of show that family isn't just blood so I'm actually keeping an eye on the chat right now because it's so interesting, the, mm-hmm. conversa- the side conversation that's happening there. And like- So there's some great some, points coming up, yes. I know, and there's and, and somebody brought up the, this fact that I was going to bring up as well, that every time they tried to bring in a female character or a love interest, she got hated right off. And I mean, we're not there yet, so I don't want to talk about that right away, but that's just the reality, unfortunately. Whenever they tried to bring in a female character that was in any, like that gave any hints that she could have been interested in in the brothers, like it was just pandemonium. Like there was no keeping her on the show. She would stay for a few episodes, maybe a season, and then that was it. So we have our hands full for the next couple of seasons. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. But at the same time, like, I, I feel like you're right. I feel like you've established this narrative of these two brothers. It's just the two of them. It's them against the world. That writing in anyone else would be hard to do. And clearly, I know they do this with Cass down the line, at least. As he does become relevant and become kind of primary for quite some time, to my knowledge. Again, I could be wrong. Who knows? It's going off the internet here. And fandom and my love for him already. <laughs> but but yeah I feel like had they started the show off like again putting on the if I were the writer of the show cap I would have whether it had been Jess or someone else I would have started with a third partner in that like troupe so it would have been Sam Dean and female protagonist and then I would have made it like very clear she is in a relationship with one of the two of them so there is no romantic tension of like oh what's happening it's really just she is a third partner in this she is an equal person in this but she is not blood family. Okay, so she's I'm accepted as family little, by both. Yeah, I'm going to give you a little piece of trivia here because 
technically that's that's Jess to a certain degree, right? If you look at season one, that's Jess. Now, hmm. um, oh God, I have such a complicated really like obviously not relationship, but like, yeah, relationship <laughs> with Eric Kripke because do you know the reason why he called her Jeff, Jess? Sorry, he called her Jess and killed her off? No, why? Because he had an ex-girlfriend named Jess who hurt him. And <sighs> every time he has to kill off, he had to kill off a girlfriend, he would call her Jess in his early work. And so, yeah, there you go. There so is I an think entire that... hour-long podcast of unpacking <laughs> that we can do in the future. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And there are receipts for this. Like, I'm not just saying this um, for fun. Like, this is really something that is documented. Like, he has said it himself. Yeah, so there you go. Like, I think Ooh. this is this is where you're starting with supernatural and female characters. So, yeah, and that's not even talking about the fact that the romantic partner could have not been a woman for one of the brothers, at least. We're, we haven't even started talking about that. But again, yeah. looking at the time, perhaps, do you want to maybe talk about like your your critical time impressions for the season? Yeah, so what I wanted to bring up in this is, so one of the things that gets me into a show like Supernatural is the same thing that gets me into a lot of shows. Another great example would be Buffy, which we've gone to a few times as a yeah. reference. And that is that this is a classic Monster of the Week storytelling mechanic meaning that every episode, bar some weird exceptions, tends to really be a creature of the week, causing chaos, horror, mischief, and death. The brothers show up to stop it. And along the way, we can advance the overarching storylines, whether it be through the creature of the week or just through other things around it. And I just feel like storytelling in this way is such an incredibly difficult road to walk. And I feel through the first season, we've really seen this. Uh, examples uh, in Skin, the shapeshifter is a great example of a creature who, as we discussed, they almost feel like they had to write him into being more gross and more evil because otherwise he'd be too empathetic yeah. or we would empathize with him too much. Sorry, yeah. it's a better way to put that. He's sympathetic, we'd empathize. That's the word. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but ultimately, it's able to do so much work in giving us a bit of a deeper look inside of being psyche and the way that they are they're linked. And then you have episodes like Bugs where the creature of the week is barely relevant. It's really just like a reason to move a plot forward and get from mm -hmm. point A to point B. The episode could otherwise be skipped, honestly, as we've said in the past. Like, it doesn't bring much. And some episodes you look at, you go, the creature, like even Phantom Traveler, they use it, albeit a little poorly at first, to help us learn about demons, even if those rules and some of those tropes change. It is educational to us as a viewer in that episode versus just being a spooky thing to deal with that week. Yeah. And I think it's just really nice to see the creature of the week can be both very tetriary to the story while the major plot points are covered by the brothers and the other humans. Uh, example, Kathleen during uh, our fight with the murder hillbilly site put it in the vendors. <laughs> yes, they themselves don't really give much. <laughs> our first real fight. <laughs> uh, they didn't really bring anything to the story, the, except the fact that they were evil and evil things happen. They allowed a third party, Kathleen, to be the focus and give us the development of the brothers and of the overarching story and of themes. Uh, versus, like I said, I keep going back to Skin as a great example, where it itself, the creature, is what helps that move the narrative. Yeah. No, you're totally right. I mean, and I think that this is also... <sighs> Ooh, okay. I might be wrong about this because I don't know for sure, but I'm sure that somebody in the chat can correct me. Um, was this Eric Kripke's first stint as a showrunner? I, I wouldn't know. know. Hopefully the audience will so, yeah. But I know that it, he was not sure. It was his first time pitching something and it being accepted. So I'm if we work on the assumption, I'm keeping my eye on the chat to see if anybody has that answer. Yeah, so if, we work on, <laughs> if we work off of the assumption that it's his first time um, as a showrunner, you can sort of see how like each episode is very influenced by the actual writer of the episode. And mm -hmm. while it does follow the idea uh, or the, the overarching um, storyline, 
Yes, it was. Thank you, Carol. So the overarching storyline for the season, you can see that there are clear stylistic differences in in each episode. And that's really what Rochelle has referred to as, you know, tossing spaghetti on this against the wall and seeing what sticks. And we're <laughs> seeing that. And, but it's true. It's such a vivid image, but it's also so accurate because you're like, they were trying things. They were trying to see like what worked best for these two characters for their storytelling type. And, and you can see that, you know, like you said, in terms of monster of the week, there are some successes and some failures, but I also, I sort of just want to come back to bugs and realize just how much we got from bugs, despite it being such a strange episode. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, it became one of my, oh, I hate to say it, but it almost became like one of my favorite ones in the season. And it started as like the bottom, like very much bottom episode of the entire series. So, so yeah, so it's, it's interesting to see how how the writers were leveraged sorry. what I'm sorry the chat's making me laugh <laughs> who hurt you I, oh, Michelle I don't think you want to start that laundry list honestly like we don't have enough time <laughs> to do this <laughs> but but yeah uh, so again uh Carol corrected us he actually did run a few episodes of a Tarzan TV show apparently which okay maybe we'll go look at one day for context I but um but yeah, this was his first time doing a full season. This is his first time really getting to do this type of show. Even if you've run a show before, this is a very different creature. Pun fully intended. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like you said, there's we, we've brought up a few times where I feel like in Skin, they play with their first like gory and murder. We, uh, I think it's in Nightmares, we have our first like major blood splatter. Yeah. Like, we, we get a lot of firsts and we sort of see what does stick and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. exactly and and it's interesting because some of those things really do stick like the blood splatter I think there's a couple of seasons where like almost every episode begins with a blood splatter so it becomes like a signature of the show then they move away from it because it's just it becomes a bit redundant but like it was just funny like at one point you, you're just going to be watching and you're like oh that's the blood splatter for this episode okay great great let's move on <laughs> and my bingo card ready <laughs> <laughs> yeah huh. I but I think that fairly wraps. <laughs> I think that fairly wraps up critical time. We got to go a little in depth on our uh, overall thoughts of the show up to this point, and I know yes. we have a very fun little activity planned for our next uh, segment. Yes. Okay. So we. Yes. So the <laughs> next segment. <laughs> this is this is stressful because we've never done this as a competition. So we are going to <laughs> do, each do a crossroads deal. Um. And we are going to set up a poll. Oh, hold on. We have a little issue with making the poll. <coughs> anyway, we'll figure that out before the end of the episode. Mm -hmm. But yes, so basically we're going to set up a poll to see which one of us you think has the best Crossroads deal. And what was the stakes? I can't remember. Oh, uh, the loser has to buy the winner a coffee. Yes, there you go. So low so stakes for now, something calm, so I can easily prepay you, but. I don't know, mine is really, really, really controversial. So I don't know, I think. We'll Very... have to see. All right, perfect. Um, Rochelle, can we get a confirmation that the poll is, uh, you can't make polls on the McGill account. I was able to make a poll. Hold Ooh. on, let me see if I can make, I can make a poll. I had a question. <laughs> Okay, Drew. Maybe do you want to get started with your poll with your um... crossword? Yeah. Yeah. Word. Okay. So for those who are uh, some, we have a lot of listeners here who are new to the show, so we'll do a really quick explanation. But the crossroads idea came as a making a kind of a monkey's paw esque wish of I wish we could change something about in this case the season rather than an episode, but ultimately have to give something up in return, like you would in a crossroads deal with a deal with the devil. So for mine, I would have liked the show to have had a slower start. We get a very action-packed first season. There's a lot going on. We develop the characters a lot. Um, earlier on, maybe the first three to four episodes, I found were much more learn who the boys were so that you can connect with them, which I think they did incredibly well. But I think they could have pushed that a little further. Ultimately, 
I know some behind the scenes we do eventually learn or it's been made aware that the show was originally pitched as a four or five season show. So with that in mind, I feel like the pace wasn't too off. But knowing that we do now that we have an additional 10 seasons beyond what they initially expected, I feel like season one could have been slower in the sense of not rushing to get to John, not rushing to get to the cult, not rushing to actually encounter the demon for what looked like a final standoff. I think those things could have been taken back a little bit had we had more time to get to know the boys, deal with some of their traumas, go into their past, meet more people from their past who could teach us more about them and John respectively. And then you could have still, towards the end of the season, brought up the legend of the cult, an encounter with the final demon, and a reunite with John for a big fight before it gets away without having to do that like three or four times over like a two-part finale. You know what? And then ultimately, yeah. Also, ultimately, you have to give something up, and obviously, the giving up would be some of the bigger action set pieces in the season. Obviously, if you're doing a slower start, you don't get John as much. You don't get uh, a final fight with the demon. You don't actually get to meet some of the bigger characters. Mm -hmm. It could have been a little more mysterious. Like have us have Meg be our final villain for this season, and then allude to the demon, aka her father, for the next season. So, yes, you would lose a lot of the development we really loved towards the end, but I think it would just make that realization a few seasons later all the better. So, I I know we said that we wouldn't necessarily respond to each other, but I have to. <laughs> no, no, take, you have to. Take a minute. Take a minute. You have to. Okay. So, I think that I agree with you in terms of the pacing itself. I'm not too sure that I would try to make it slower, but I like the idea of changing the pacing where like not everything happens in the last like three episodes. I would have liked to see that like spread out a bit more over the season. Like I would have liked to get to know the dynamic between the boys a little better between, sorry, between the boys and their father a little better. I would have liked to know yeah, I would have liked to know about that a little bit yeah. more. And you can, and I think that this is something that was really indeed needed because if you look at the, uh, like the products that were launched afterwards, like one of them includes a book um, where it's like John's journal where he talks about his life with the boys uh, before Supernatural starts. So I think that there was truly a need for that. People and fans like wanted to know more about it. And I wish that we had gotten that in season one. Okay. And what would be your uh, crossroads deal to compete with me? <laughs> okay. All right. So I remember that I started off the season with a very controversial deal. And I'm actually yeah. surprised that I never got any pushback from listeners about it because I was certain that I would. Um, and I had wished that Mary had lived and that John had died. And I have to say that I stick to this one, not because their lives would have been better, not because their lives would have been more loving or tender or anything like that. But I'm really curious to see how Mary would have handled this entire situation instead of John, because we know what John does, right? We know how he raises the boys, but we never get a chance to really see Mary raising the boys, emphasis on raising here for anyone who's seen the later seasons. So I really think that, like, I, I really, I would have wanted to see that. And I feel like we were much like the boys, we were robbed of that. And I, if I could go back and, and mm-hmm. make a deal, it would be that, that John would die and that Mary would stay alive. And I mean, the, the benefit of this is the uh, what you give up is kind of baked right into the answer. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. And I, I give up John and I keep Mary. <laughs> and I think so two angles from this I want to uh, quickly respond to. And one are, I do love this deal. For one major reason, I think the show definitely lacks a strong female character. It lacks female characters, but that's a whole other bucket of worms for another day. But I think this would have been a great way to have a strong female protagonist, even if they have their, you know, let, let's even assume they have to have all the same flaws that John have of being not the best parent or, you know, treating them like soldiers versus children, uh, forcing Dean into this role of a parent. It still would have given us a female character with some layers and some qualities that isn't just a 
this is my girlfriend Cass. She was my girlfriend, and now she's a girl who's not my girlfriend. Or Jess, who is she's pretty, and now she's dead. We don't have the best track records, at least in this season, and from what I've been made to believe, most of the series when it comes to women in the show. So I think that would have been a really good way of getting a powerful woman in the show. Mm-hmm. But the other side of it too is uh, certain people in this audience can respond to this and know what I'm talking about. I love the what if story. I really enjoy the here is a thing you love. What if it was different? You know, mm-hmm. what if things happen? You know, Marvel was famous for this and they're doing a whole Disney Plus series about it. And it's the idea of like, here are these worlds you know and love. Let's make one major tweak and then see what the story would be. I would love to see if they ever revisit it as a comic or a short story or a fan fiction of just the major beats of the first season, but done with Mary instead of John. How would it change? I mean, I think what I would really want to know is like how how guilt-ridden would Mary be about this? Because that's truly, yeah, there you go. That's truly yeah. where my question lies. Are we ready to launch the poll? Yep, let's see who's buying who a coffee. Yeah. Obviously, you and I can't vote. I, I can, no, I can physically see that, but also it would be unfair. Uh, while <laughs> oh the God. votes are coming do, in. Do you want to tell the story of when we, we practiced this like a couple days ago? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a few days ago, we did a dry run of the show just to kind of be like, let's make sure everything's working because clearly we had no technical difficulties today. <laughs> but... We put up, Rochelle both demoted us so we could vote, put up the poll. We both voted and the poll comes up and it's exactly 50-50 because we both just voted for the other one. <laughs> and it just, we sort of had a moment of like, yeah, we are each other's biggest fans. That's how this works. Yep, that tracks, that tracks. Okay. Yep. And there's okay, still one more chance, vote that hasn't come in yet. Last chance to vote, you guys. No, oh, I mean... <laughs> I mean, realistically, I'm looking at the results and the number of votes. Even if the 17th of 17 votes comes in, we have a winner. Okay. All right, then. So, Mary, congratulations. I will be delivering your coffee by by next weekend for you. Thank you. (laughs) That's awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Just just text me your order so I make sure I get it right for you. Yes. Okay. Or should I just pull a D and give you a plain black coffee? No, no, I would be very disappointed if there was no milk or sugar in my coffee. (laughs) (laughs) A little reference for those of you who follow our TikToks. Yes, which you should actually follow our TikToks because we put a lot of effort into them. (laughs) We put a lot of effort into the ones that don't get loved and we put, I mean, you put effort into, but it feels like a lot more shit posting than the ones that get all the attention. So I got to follow you on that one. I got a few blanks. I feel like that's the nature of TikTok, but moving on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So that sort of brings us to the end of what would be a regular episode of the show. Although we did skip one major part that we usually have in our episodes. And that is a uh, voicemail from the community where we ask you guys to uh, feed into us and give us what to talk about, ideas, thoughts, some compliments here and there. <laughs> and we wanted to open the floor here and let you all ask questions or share comments or bring up talking points. So I know Rochelle is going to be the one uh, emceeing this because she runs the show. We all know it. Yeah. So you can either use like that raise hand function or you can toss a question in the chat. Um, You know, uh, we asked you, we, (laughs) we asked you if there was a crossroads deal that you'd like to make, like this would be the time to share it if you'd like, of course. Um, so yeah, we're going to give you a, a little moment to do that. Yeah, we'll be monitoring the chat and if anything pops up we like, we're going to pull up and uh, discuss. I almost want to scroll back while we're waiting because there were a few that I really liked. Yeah. <laughs> I, like that, I like that Ben actually pulled up the plain black coffee thing. The way <laughs> to go. No. Someone brought up... Oh, I'm just going to address this. The idea of a seasonal bingo card, I kind of want to look into this now. <laughs> like, oh thank God, you, those yes. of you who mentioned it. I see Michelle brought it up. I see Kim was responded as well. I do like that idea. I think, unfortunately, it would have to be a Mary and Michelle project because I don't know what to expect. Or is that better? Because I don't know what to expect. So I'd be <sighs> making bets. Ooh. Okay, we're discussing this one off air for sure. <laughs> 
I'll put my BFA to good use. Okay, Carol is volunteering as tribute. Do we yes, wanna... please. I asked, uh, I unmuted you, Carol. I asked, oh, yeah, there we go, oh, perfect. God. Oh God, you think I get better at the, 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 the technical part of this after <laughs> doing this a few times with you and it's not any better. No, I volunteered as tribute that I will, I will, I will help make those bingo cards. I'll <laughs> force Kevin to like graphically design them. Um, oh but if my you God, did, yes, please. If you did want a question, I'm really sorry, you can't answer this. Mary, do you think Mary would have been more driven by revenge or less driven by revenge than John? I'm not going to use my my background in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> no, but that's a really good question. So, would she have been more or less driven by revenge? So, I think, frankly, that she might have actually been more driven by revenge because she would have known right away what would have made, like, what 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 happened, because she, well, again, I, yeah, she knows. She has context. She has context. She has the context that John lacked at the very beginning. Um, so I also fully concur with Nell there. I think she, this would have been a three season show because Mary would have been like, and Yellow Eyed Demon is gone. But that's also, so that's what I was going to say. I feel like perhaps she would have also been more effective than John has been. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I'm also, I don't know. I feel like maybe she would have had a better network to rely upon than John mm -hmm. did. And so, yeah, I, I, what interests me the most is really to see how, how she would have dealt with all of that, knowing that they were the direct consequences of things. Of we know what. <laughs> yeah. For uh, I, think I, I just, I, <laughs> I just, I, I know I can't really answer the question, but I just feel like every time I hear more about Mary in the show, I get more excited to eventually get to learn more about her. Mm -hmm. And I feel bad that that comes from other fans and not from the show itself. And maybe we'll yeah. get there again. That's again, part of the, I don't know. Maybe we'll hit a point where the show starts dropping hints to lead the, the viewer on. But even just from the fandom itself, without spoiling me, I am so intrigued to learn more. Mm -hmm. uh, I also wanted to throw it to a question we actually got from Julie uh, in the chat, which was the, what is some of your favorite memories from recording? Do you want to start? I think for me, it's any time you're a little on the loopier side, Mary, and whenever we get to a segment break, you tend to sing the music that would be in there while we do this edit. <laughs> like, we'll have a moment where we're recording, we end on like a good sentimental line that's kind of like a weird hush, and then Mary just goes, <laughs> and it just gets me every time i've actually exported a few of them for future uh, blooper reels <laughs> yeah yeah so basically i feel like the reason why i can be so goofy is because it, it feels like such a safe space also mm -hmm. so thank you for creating that um yeah and, and i have to say that yes so i i really love those spirals that we get into. So whenever you, like I say something and then you say something and then it sparks something in me and then it sparks something in you. And then we're like, but what about this? And then we get into these conversations. And I feel like this is when I learn the most about the show and about the characters. And yeah. And then of course, like snacking in between like segments is also very nice. <laughs> <laughs> the famous peanut incident that has only been <sighs> spoken of in rumors and hush tones. I know. I know. I didn't think you were recording. <laughs> uh, I want to tackle another question I see in the chat, unless I'm missing some, Rochelle. I don't want to overstep. No, I think we have time for about one more. Uh, Nell has a really good question. Um, from the first episode to the last of the season, how do you think the relationship between the brothers change? Ooh. <laughs> May I go first? Mm, sure. <sighs> I think the biggest change really comes and again we've touched on family we've made it very clear that it's an evolution in the family bonds between them and I think it's the fact that at the beginning it very much feels like Dean going hey this is a family responsibility Sam you have to come along and Sam is only there because he feels obliged to and very 
smoothly, and I feel like Scarecrow is a big turning point for this, and an episode I keep going back to for this reason, is it's the first time it feels like, hey, he is the person I care about and have an emotional bond with, and I need to be there for them. Yeah. And suddenly, so- it's not a matter of, he's my brother, I have to do things because he's my brother. It's, I want to do these things because I want to be there for him, and I want him to feel comfortable, safe, and happy. And ultimately the big moment that we kind of joked about it uh, in the upcoming finale episode we discussed the puppy dog moment where you kind of have air quote john trying to get dean to, uh, sam to come to his side while dean is trying to go no come to me it's yeah. literally the two of them with the puppy dog going well, come here sam th- though there is a pause because it's dad versus brother he then has that moment where he goes they're both family but one of them is someone who truly has been there for me and has truly supporting me and I've supported and that is Dean and suddenly it's not just he's family he's brother he is someone I'm bonded to in more ways than just we have the same parent yeah yeah and I I would absolutely agree with that I think that Sam now chooses Dean as his family Mm -hmm. and I think that that's really the main difference but I will also argue that it like because this is okay so this is a huge shift to no because there's a lot of of layers so (laughs) yes this is a huge shift but when I first heard the question my first instinct was I'm not sure that it changes that much and here's why because we see throughout the season very much of like a parent-child relationship between the two and like we've talked about this ad nauseum like through the season where Dean is parenting Sam and Sam lets him because that's what he knows. And he, I think he really does see him more as a parent than he sees John. And we see that, especially like in the later episodes, like we've talked about it, where Dean is parenting Sam in front of John and John just doesn't intervene. Like he doesn't say anything because to him, that's also normal. Um, And then I can't remember if this is in Salvation or devil's trap that we talked about this but like dean tries to talk to sam as an equal like he tries to open up to him and to say like this is Mm -hmm. something that i'm vulnerable about so he he makes that attempt at like equalizing the relationship and sam can't he just can't like he he changes the topic and he's unable really to even address it and so in that respect i don't think the relationship changes that much do you want, so, so sorry, we're just going to read Nell's response. So yeah, I'm uh, just reading through it. I was, I was trying to read without being too <laughs> like, obvious. We see it change a little, but I'm not sure the brothers recognize it. It takes a long time for them to reconcile. And at this point, I think they have such vastly different memories of their childhood. That's so true. And such wildly different perceptions of what happened that they are stuck on opposite sides of a bridge that's got a gap in the middle. Ugh. very well put very well worded and i think that's that's something we didn't really breach we didn't really broach the subject too much here we have in other episodes and without going too far because we're running out of time that is the fact that their memories of childhood like sam has virtually zero memory dean at least has a few years of having a stable family home Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it does also affect the way they look at family and the way they look at their upbringing Mm -hmm. yeah i mean sam has never had that example, as you said. So for him, of course, the ideal is what he's seen on TV. Mm -hmm. Again, like we talk, I think we really have to talk about that a a lot more about how these boys were raised by TV. Yeah. And like TV in the 80s and 90s. (laughs) Yeah. Which I think speaks to Sam's chosen one complex. You look at TV in that era, but that's a whole other can of worms. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, maybe a mini-sode at some point about TV in the 80s and 90s. would be fun. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, I think oh. that does bring us to the end of our time, unfortunately. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, are we then ready to do our outro? Let's make it all official and stuff. Oh, my goodness. You've been listening to Carrying Wayward, a supernatural podcast produced by Rochelle Castellano, hosted by Mary Figueroa, and myself, Drew Shulman. This week, we'd like to thank everyone who was able to make it out to our first live show for their participation. To help us keep the conversation going, you can send us a voice recording or email at carryingwayward at gmail.com. 
And you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and our famous TikTok channel using at Carrying Wayward. Subscribe on Spotify or Apple Podcasts for weekly content, including some special episodes like this one. We also do encourage you to leave us a review, at least on iTunes. Five stars are always appreciated. And uh, we'll be taking a small two-week break, but we'll be back on May 21st with Season 2, Episode 1, In My Time of Dying. Will we see you there? Carry on, our wayward friends. And we are now going to unmute everyone so that we can all say goodbye. How do we unmute all? Oh, yes. I think you guys can, can you all unmute if you'd like. Okay, yeah, they have to unmute themselves. Oh. <laughs>